So it's First Peter and it's chapter 3. But as we begin, I'm just going to say, what is up with you lot? You know, what, what's happening? What's going on over here? There's something odd about you lot. Um, or at least there should be, shouldn't there? And that's what we've been thinking about the last few weeks as we've been thinking about First Peter, that there's something odd about us. Or at least there should be something odd about us. We should be different. We should be different to those around us. We're called to be different. We're called to live differently to those around us so that people can't help but notice there's something different about us. So they might scratch their heads and say, what's up with you? You know, Peter says that we're not supposed to just blend in, that we're meant to stand out, that when the world's shouting, that we respond with grace. Whenever other people fight back and there's something happens that causes some kind of disruption, that we can offer peace, that whenever our life hits hard, that we can stand firm. And that it gives us a hope that even in the middle of difficulty and turmoil, the people say, well, what makes them so different? How come he is able to have that grace or how come she is able to have that hope in the middle of that difficulty? How come they can still find joy in the middle of what they're going through? We should live as changed people, shouldn't we? And anyone who encounters Jesus shouldn't walk away the same as when they met him. We should be different. And that's what First Peter is about. Partly that's what it's about. It's, a, it's full of life, First Peter. And it's deeply challenging. And it teaches us that following Jesus should totally transform every single part of our lives. It calls us to be different. And that includes our relationships as well, as we're going to see here in First Peter chapter 3. That instead of focusing on whatever I can get and whatever we can get in our relationships, that the gospel frees us to be giving in our relationships and to be selfless givers in the way that we respond and live to those around us. And that includes in our relationships the way that we submit to others as well, the way we submit to our authorities, to the, our government and so on as well. And... That's why in chapter 2 we have this repeated call to be subject, be subject, be subject. It says over and over again. And it echoes these teachings about the submission to authority. For example, in chapter 2 verse 13 we read, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. Or, or verse 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And this call to be subject now applies in marriage in chapter 3. So we're going to read verse 1 to 7 together and I'll put it up on the screen as well. But we'll read verse 1 to 7 first and see what Peter is writing as he's writing to wives and then husbands. And he says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word, by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewellery or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And so you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honour to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, in modern day reading as we read this in our culture I'm sure it, you might not be the only person who might stand and pull back a wee bit when you read this passage certainly the world does as, as they read it and it says wives be subject to your own husbands and it could be very easy to pull back and from that command and think whoa hold on here you know that sounds backward in today's society that doesn't sound fair that doesn't sound equal and yet submission while it's an unpopular word today it still remains central in both Peter and Paul's teachings on marriage, if you read Paul's teachings in Ephesians chapter 5. But it's not about inferiority. That's what the world will tell us. So don't stay away from the Bible. Look, it's telling wives to be subject to husbands. That's telling us that wives are inferior to husbands, that women are inferior to men. But the Bible never supports that idea. 
The Bible never supports the idea that women are less than men. One of the reasons for our, our objection, of course, to wives being submissive is this modern movement that we have today of feminism. Now, don't get me wrong, feminism does have some good qualities about it. It rightly challenges the, the notion of female inferiority and, and, and expands opportunities for women, all of which are necessary and positive steps forward. And while feminism has brought about some really positive changes, it has also been used as a crux to fuel issues like the promotion of abortion, which is a deep moral crisis in the West, the killing of the unborn. And tensions within families as well have happened because of it. Power struggles between husband and wife. And these conflicts have actually caused real damage in the home. It hasn't been helpful. It hasn't been good for women or for men. And so as Christians, our beliefs must come from scripture, not from the cultural trend of the day. It shouldn't come from political correctness. It should come from the Bible and see what does the Bible have to teach us. And the Bible doesn't equate submission with authority. Culture often does, but scripture is clear. Men and women are equal in, in dignity and value. In fact, the very same passage does go on to say that, that we were made in God's image and that men and women are heirs of the grace of life. So we're, women are heirs of the grace with us, men, of the grace of life. And so we are seen as equal before God. God made us both. He loves us all. But in marriage, God assigns different roles. Husbands are given a call and women are given a call. Husbands are called to lead, not because they're in any way superior, but because God has given them that responsibility. And Peter's call for wives to submit it's not about inferiority, it's about structure. It's like, for example, if you were um, going to wash the dishes and you say, oh, I'll wash you dry. It doesn't mean that the dryer is inferior to the washer or vice versa. It's just a structure in the home. And after all, this is the structure that God has given us because he knows that this is what makes a happy and content home. And just after all, you know, the son, Jesus Christ, he submits to the father, but he's not lesser than the father, is he? This is their role within the Godhead. So the rules in marriage reflect order. It doesn't reflect worth. And the Bible calls for unconditional love and submission. Husbands must love their wives. We're told to live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honour to her. And wives must submit even when it's hard. And when both fulfil their roles, the home becomes what God intended, a foundation for society and the church. And of course, husbands, that doesn't mean we're meant to be making decisions alone. Ignoring your wife's wisdom is, is foolish and it's actually unbiblical as well. But wives also shouldn't be following the cultural trend of mocking or belittling your husband. Um, I, often that's the conversation in the workplace. You hear men being talked down on in a, in a sense. So they should be showing respect to how they speak and about him. And the same way that the man should be showing respect in how he speaks and about his wife as well that we should encourage each other and that women should encourage men to grow into the men God calls them to be. And men should encourage women to grow into the women that God calls them to be. And so submission shouldn't surprise us. You know, we, as Christians, we've already submitted to Christ, haven't we? That shapes how we live, how we relate to others, and especially in marriage as well, that we do everything to the Lord, ultimately. And in marriage, marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. So that's why it's so important that we follow this structure because it's meant to be a beautiful picture of how Christ loves the church, that Christ leads the church. He, he even laid down his life for the church and the church should want to follow a leader like that. And so Peter reminds us in chapter two, he said, servants be subject to your masters. So he reminds us that no matter what the circumstances, we can always live for Christ even if it's under harsh conditions. Now, Peter's not promoting slavery here. He's speaking into a, a harsh reality of that day. There were many servants, there were many masters. So he was speaking into what was the tradition and the culture at that time, and he's speaking to these slaves and servants. It, it did no good to say, oh, you shouldn't be slaves or servants, or that shouldn't be happening, because it was happening. He needed to help them where they were at. And so he's telling them, be subject to your masters. Why? Because you're living for Christ, not for them. 
And actually by doing so, you might even win these masters to Christ by the way that you're living in a different way to live differently and to point others to Jesus Christ. Because we live for him, after all. We don't live for the world. And that's why we even have these commands to submit to masters and authorities. And so submission is actually seen as a gracious thing. We saw in chapter 2 as well, in verse 19. So it reflects the grace that was given to us. We are able to be submissive in certain areas of life because we have been given grace by God to be able to do so. We belong to Christ. We don't belong to our state. We don't belong to our employer. We belong to Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ, who has changed me, can then go and change others as well. And God calls all believers, and here in chapter 3, especially married couples, to serve Jesus Christ by serving one another at home. And that's what he's saying here in the house with husbands and wives, that by fulfilling their roles, they're serving Jesus Christ. Now you'll notice actually when we read that passage that Paul spent, or sorry, Peter spent more time addressing wives than he did um, husbands. Now if you read Ephesians chapter 5, you'll get more about husbands as well. But I believe here that the reason Peter's spending more time addressing wives is because um, these particular wives that he's writing to were in difficult marriages with non-believers who were not happy with the fact that these women were Christians and didn't like the fact that they were living differently and didn't like the fact that they had been changed by God. And so his message is don't it's very sensitive in the home at the minute with this husband who's not happy with your um, conversion to Christ because in that culture as well that was seen as the woman standing up against the husband and saying you know no I'm not going to follow your religion I've got my own and that would have been seen as a real backstabbing kind of reaction to the husband so they had to be sensitive about how they went about this and so Peter was saying don't attack your husband with the gospel but instead of just preaching he's saying Glorify God with your actions. Show your husbands Christ's grace through a transformed life. And of course, if they're living differently, then those opportunities for discussions will naturally flow out as well. But So therefore, that's why he said in this particular situation that even without words, a wife's conduct can draw her husband to Christ. And I'm saying that about this being a particular situation because we can read that and think to ourselves, oh, you know, it's not about words. We can just act and live for God. But words are very important. We are meant to be speaking of Christ. We're meant to be speaking of him. And, you know, you hear about the, you know, live for Christ and use words if you have to. We do have to use words. We are called to use words to speak of God. It is very important. And it's God's words that have spoken to us. And we're now called to pass on his words to others. But in this situation, he's saying to these wives, you know, if your husband's not listening to you, then live differently and show them by your, your conduct that this is real. Your transformation is true so it's not so much meaning silence but it's warning against taking on a teaching role instead of being a loving partner and so the ultimate goal is for husbands to see jesus christ's grace in their wives and that's you know the most difficult place to be showing that you're different is in their family isn't it because those are the people that know you best but then if they can see that you're different then that shows that you truly are that god really is working within you it's a powerful life-changing testimony and so peter he gives special advice for wives with non-believing husbands but this message then goes on to apply to all wives he says that true beauty isn't about outward appearance instead peter is emphasizing inner beauty and it sounds a bit cliche doesn't it but it's true that the inner beauty is what truly matters you know we live in a world that is totally obsessed with looks I remember whenever I was in school, um, I don't remember a lot about school sometimes, but I remember in, sitting in English literature and thinking about what I could be doing once school was over. And we were looking at a poem called The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope. And we were having to go and study the poem and so on. I haven't looked at it since, since that day. But I remember there was a line that, that stuck in my head, actually. And it was, beauty's in vain, their pretty eyes may roll. Charm strikes the sight, but merit wins the soul. And I thought that was really good. Beauty's in vain, their pretty eyes may roll. Charm strikes the sight, but merit wins the soul. And what I liked about it was that this was a secular writer who was writing, but and the whole idea of the poem was kind of um, making fun of men and women who were in upper class um, situations. But in that wee line, that kind of draws us to First Peter, doesn't it? Because 
it's not about the outward appearance. It's about what's in the heart that changes. Um, or if you're watching Matilda, and Matilda's mum says, you chose books, I chose looks, she says to the teacher. <laughs> um, and actually the point of that, as you're watching that movie, you're meant to be drawn to the teacher, not the mum. So it's showing that the in inward beauty is what really matters. And so we live in a world that's obsessed with looks. For example, if I was to take a, a, fit, a group photo right now and put it on the screen, you know, who, who the first person that you'd look at be? It'd be yourself, wouldn't it? And Peter is reminding us that inner beauty, what's in the heart, is what truly matters. You know, if you want to be drawing someone to God, it's not about, you know, oh, it's, oh that person wasn't one to Christ because I didn't put enough um, freeze gel in my lovely big hair today or whatever but God draws others to him through our characters doesn't he and through how we live that people think well he seems to be really changed by God maybe there's something about this Jesus Christ that I want to follow as well and so prioritizing character over looks is key and that, it goes on to talk about this gentle and quiet spirit that Peter speaks of which reflects Jesus Christ's character it's not a stereotype it's the fact that we and should have this gentle and quiet spirit that points others to Jesus Christ, this inner beauty that models Jesus' heart. And our standard, our standard isn't found in media. It's found in scripture. It's not about which social media influencer or which person on the screen that we want to follow. It's about following Jesus Christ and being made more like him. And so wives are told to let their adorning be the hidden person of the heart, the impartial beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. Why should be loving and supportive, reflecting the harmony that God designed. And that's true feminism, isn't it? Celebrating feminine qualities in women. That actually these things are to be celebrated. That a, a, a gentle and quiet spirit and um, the hidden person of the heart and so on is often nowadays seen as, oh no, uh, you know, women should be abrasive and, and kind of um, aggressive in the way that they go about things or whatever. But... These are celebrating feminine qualities and, and in the same way we should celebrate masculine qualities in men as well. Not this toxic masculinity that we talk about nowadays, but actually it can be a good thing to be a man, it's a good thing to be a woman, and that men and women are different and we're called to live in our roles. And so of course asking if it's harder to be a wife or a husband, well that misses the point entirely. It's not about comparing roles, it's about fulfilling your role faithfully. And for husbands, this means service and self-sacrifice. It doesn't mean abuse. It doesn't mean exploitation with your call for leadership. It means to be serving the wife and to be self-sacrificial, looking to her needs. Just as Jesus, Jesus never mistreated the church, did he? His bride. And so a husband's love should be pure. It should be selfless. And, and how good has Jesus been to us? When we look to him, our true Husband in a sense, and we, and we think about that Jesus Christ who won us, his bride, over to himself and who has paid the great price that we couldn't pay on the cross and has been raised again into new life and is with us each and every day and, and has promised that one day he'll wipe away every tear. He loves us, he cares for us, he's self-sacrificial. The greatest sacrifice of all time. How good he's been to us and what a calling it is for husbands. And it reminds us, husbands, never think you've got it sorted. Whenever you look to Jesus Christ and you see his life, then we'll always know that we're falling short in that sense. But we ask God for his grace and help each day. And whenever we do slip and fall and mess up, we come back to him and ask for help again. And notice, actually, his first command here isn't to lead. Oh, go back again. There you go. His first command isn't to lead, but to understand and to honour his wife and therefore love her in that sense. In Ephesians 5, it talks more about the leadership of husbands and how they should love their wives as well, just as Christ loved the church. What a command that is. And so the call to understand your wife is a big one. You know, I've, I've been married now for seven years and I'm still trying to understand Ellen. <laughs> but I'm very, very thankful for her. And she's a real picture of a very kind, loving and supportive wife. I did tell her I wasn't going to go into too much, but uh, <laughs> she, is, she, she is really like the kind of woman that I, I'm so thankful for. And I'm so thankful for our wee kids as well and what a great wee family we have. And I thank God for that and I thank God for Ellen. And, and husbands, we're called to understand our own wives. And that's so that we can properly honour them for who they are. You know, that each husband and wife is going to be different. Each relationship is different. Just because one wife likes Snickers doesn't mean another wife does. 
you know, maybe if your wife's allergic to nuts, maybe it's not a good idea to give her Snickers, <laughs> you know. So understand them, care for them. Your love is sacrificial, it's modeled after Christ. You should honor your wife in the way that you live. As Christ gave himself for the church out of his immense love. And, and then you see that actually that calling is, is hard too, isn't it? You know, you think, well, why is it, can I make myself? Oh, it's just a really hard command to submit, and it is. Husbands, you also have a really hard command to give yourself for your wife, to be self-sacrificial in the way that you live. And you see, if both are fulfilling those rules, that's when it's a, a happy, happy marriage that honours God and points others to him. And so honouring and understanding your wife makes, means making sure she always feels loved and cherished and that you should care for her spiritually as well. Praying together, reading the Bible, being part of a church that supports both of you. And now, of course, after this, Peter moves on now from marital relationships and he moves to all of us. But the, the call is still the same, to live differently, that we are designed to be different. We should all live in a way that is different, set apart for Jesus Christ. So we'll read verse 8 together. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So after discussing how we relate to the state and society in chapter 2, and here the home in chapter 3, Peter now turns to the church in verse 8, and he says, Finally, all of you. And he speaks to the church. And he's, and he's not concluding when he says finally, by the way. He's just kind of shifting focus in a sense. He's still talking about living differently, but he's now shifting his focus to the whole church. And this is now for, for all of us, um, whether or not you're a husband or wife or ever plan to be, that this is for you, for all of us as a church, that Peter is teaching us how to live as Christians in a world that feels foreign, in a world that feels hostile. Though we're citizens of heaven, we live under earthly kingdoms, some of which, of course, oppose Jesus, but our true master is in heaven, not here on earth. And so that helps us to live differently. And this strength to live out our faith in this world, it comes from the support of our church family. And so that's why it's such a calling for us, isn't it? To have unity of mind so that we can be um, helping each other and building each other up and encouraging each other and strengthening each other. Because it's not an easy race, the Christian race. And we're not designed to run it alone. God has called us to run together and to be comrades and to point each other to Christ and to strengthen each other and to look out for each other. And the church, it's not about blind conformity. It's about unity, isn't it? We're meant to have unity in the essentials. One Lord, one baptism, one faith, one God. And of course, we might minor and, and my, we might differ, sorry, on minor matters. Like, for example, you might have a different opinion about the furniture in the, in the room or whatever. But we need to remain united in what truly matters. And let that be what truly matters. Sometimes it's the secondary things that become more important to us. But actually, it's about keeping the main thing the main thing, isn't it? And letting those secondary things be secondary and not become such a divisive thing that we end up breaking up over it. Um, so we should be looking to stay united in what truly matters, submitting to God's word. And then Peter calls us to love. And he says, brotherly, brotherly love, which I enjoy reading because I have a brother, of course. Um, and ever we think about that, you think about how the fact that God has called us to be his adopted children. We're called to be siblings in a sense, aren't we? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And whenever we disagree, like siblings, we still remain united by our shared father. Even though we might disagree about certain things, we're still a team, we're still together, we're still a church. You know, Joseph and Abigail, they might disagree about whose turn it is to play with a toy, and they might get annoyed about that for a time, but they're still a wee team, and I enjoy saying that. And um, My brother, Alan, my twin brother, he and I, we might have a very different opinion on a lot of things, but we're, we're a team and we're together, and I stand by him and he stands by me, and I know that if something went wrong, he'd be there for me, and vice versa. And that, that strong connection is still there, despite even if we might have very different opinions on certain things, that we know we're there for each other. And it's the same with my sisters as well, and Rebecca and Katie. We're, we're all together as a team, and we're, we've all got each other's backs. And that's why it's meant to be as a church, though, isn't it? That's why he's using this picture that we're meant to be, as a church, united. 
And even though there might be someone in the church who might have a very different opinion to you, one that you might even find hurtful, that you're still going to be able to work together on that. For the sake of unity, we're called to be united. Peter urges us to be tender-hearted, doesn't he? To have a tender heart, showing gentleness in the church about how we deal with things as well. He teaches us to respond to the world differently, not with the same hostility that we, that we encounter, but that we can respond with grace. And it's kind of troubling, isn't it, whenever Christians kind of mirror the world's anger. You turn on the TV, for example, you have a political debate, and it's um, left wing and right wing, and they're having a discussion about something. If you were to mute it, so just forget who you might agree with as, as you're listening to it. If you were to just press mute on your, on your remote and just watch them, quite often you'll see that it's the same hostility hostility is met with more hostility and just anger and they're shouting at each other but we should be reacting with grace shouldn't we and that disarms humility and it reflects jesus christ and helps point others to him our focus should be on heaven and whenever we return good for evil we model jesus christ and store up blessings in eternity and that's what we read here that we may obtain a blessing So that's why we don't repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling. We bless and therefore we are pointing others to Christ. And we know that one day, even if not in this earth, we will obtain a blessing with God in heaven. And it makes people ask, what makes you different? What's up with you? Why are you living differently? And they might even for a time, you might get further suffering because of it. They might think you're weak because you didn't stand up to someone or because you didn't reply in a certain way. But over time, they might be pointed down to Christ and see that actually this is a form of strength. The fact that you are living in a way that is not what is expected. And so Peter goes on to describe this life that looks and acts different to the world. In verse 10, he says, Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You know, our words are meant to honour God. And yet so often, don't we, we slander and we deceive. But Peter is warning us how destructive the tongue can be. He says there, keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And he compares James, for example, in the book of James, he warns us how destructive the tongue can be. And he compares it to a spark that can set a forest on fire, a blaze, one tiny little spark that sets a whole big forest on fire. And our our words, they hold great power, but we're called to use them wisely, aren't we? And in verse 11, Peter calls us to actively seek peace and pursue it i like that he says seek peace it's not just have peace but actively seek after peace and pursue it it's not just about being peaceful it's about passionately chasing after godly peace and and true peace might be like that sometimes it's a real challenge to the status quo to chase after peace but we've been called to live differently and so verse 12 says the eyes of the lord are on the righteous And his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God watches over the righteous. He listens to their prayers. But he turns away from those who do evil. And James again he echoes that. He says that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In James 5 verse 16. And God is eagerly listening to his people. But he shuts his ears to the self-serving prayers of the insincere. And perhaps we feel a challenge in that too. Sometimes you might wonder why your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. But actually, is your prayer self-centered? Is it insincere? Is it for yourself, really? Or is it for giving glory to God? It's a challenge, isn't it? Verse 13 says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honour Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, I actually really think this, this chapter's class as well, or this verse's class, verse 15, anyone being prepared to make a defence, sorry, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's That's the basis for apologetics, isn't it? You might have heard of, apologetics is where you're giving a reasoned defense for the christian faith that 
that Christianity involves both the heart and the mind. That we're not called to throw our brains out the window whenever you become a Christian. We're called to chase after God with our minds too. That truth, truth needs to be understood, doesn't it? To be embraced by the heart. If we don't understand the truth, we'll not embrace it. And some might say, oh, you don't, really, you need, don't need to understand Jesus, just love him. They might say, and I understand what they're saying by that is we can't fully understand God. But we do need to, to chase after him and grow to want to know him better in his word. You know, the very second you ask someone, well, who is Jesus? Well, they're going to have to use your mind now to answer that, aren't you? You're going to have to engage the mind to define who Jesus is. And so if we want to get to know God better, read this book, read his word. Spend time with him. If, you, if, you, if you're married to someone, you're not going to say, oh, I'm married, that's great now, so I'll see you in 15 years. You know, we're meant to be getting to know them better. And in the same way, we're meant to be getting to know God better. It's not simply a ticket to heaven. It's getting to know God and follow him and chase after him and have a relationship with him. Becoming a, becoming a Christian means understanding God's word as he intends it to be understood. So that whenever people do throw things at us that are objecting to the Bible, that we will have a strong and firm understanding of the Bible, to, that that won't shake us in our faith. That we can give a reasoned defence to those people. That, and that still relies on faith. It's not all about just, just the mind. We are to engage the heart as well. And a reasoned defence still relies on faith because we'll, we'll never fully understand God's ways. And however, by getting to know God better, we still are able to have faith in those times. For example, if um, I was going to the doctor for medicine, I don't have to fully understand the medicine or how understand what the doctor understands. I just need to be able to trust the doctor to be able to receive the medicine. And if you were going on an airplane, you don't have to understand how to fly it. You have to be able to trust the pilot. We do it all the time. But by trusting God beyond what we can verify directly, that's faith, isn't it? But to trust God, we need need to understand him better. And then that's why we're called to read about him in his word and to spend time with him. So it is faith, but it's also making a defense for your faith. And we can make that offense with humility, gentleness and respect. Because if you are knowing good answers to questions that people come up with, but you do it in an abrasive and strong way, no, this is the way it is, and it becomes an argument, that's not going to point anyone to Christ. It's just going to get them more angry, isn't it? If you had a Liverpool supporter and a Man United supporter went into a bar and they had an hour to try to convince the other person that their team's better, they'll still walk out a Liverpool supporter and a Man United supporter as they were before, despite all the defences they made, especially if it was a heated argument. But we're called not to make having heated arguments. It's pointing others to Christ, but also making a defence for our faith. Verse 16 says, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. So whenever you do engage in debates, it can be easy to let emotions take over. And I, I get that. I know that. And I've been there. I know how it feels, especially when it's someone you love and, and they don't see God the way that you want them to see him. And, and it could be very, because you care about that person so much, it brings up strong emotions. But it's important, isn't it, that we have that good conscience that says that we can be peaceful in those times and help to point them to Christ and pray for them so that those who revile your good behaviour may be put to shame. And then we're going to go on to verse 17. It says, For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So, you know, we may suffer for living differently, but if we look to Christ who suffered on our behalf, we can go free. Isn't that right? That's what we read here. It's better to suffer for doing good, but Christ He's our great sufferer. He's the one who's, who went before us, who ran the race ahead of us. And whilst we're suffering for doing good, that living differently might mean suffering. When we look to Christ and see his great suffering on the cross, that he has taken on our sin, that we can go free and have his forgiveness, that enables us then to go out and to serve him better. 
And then, of course, we go on to this passage about um, Christ speaking to spirits in prison. And that's puzzled interpreters. And I've been, I was looking at different comment. Every single commentary seems to have a different opinion on what that means. Um, what we can say, Christ was made alive by the Spirit. Well, that like re likely refers to the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. But who are the spirits in prison? You know, when was Jesus in the prison ministry? You might ask yourself, like, what does it mean here that he's proclaimed to the spirits in prison? Well, there are lots of suggestions, and I do encourage you can look them up when you go home. I'll just make my suggestion, which is that it could be talking about those who are spiritually imprisoned as opposed to literally in prison, in a sense that they're held captive by sin, and that just as those who perished in the flood in Noah's day, um, so those who have heard Christ's words and rejected them are left captive in their sin as well. And that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is both a means for salvation for those who believe, but it's also an indictment for those who don't believe. It's judgment on those who do not believe in God. And that makes sense for what follows, it says in verse 20, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. So here in verse 20 and 21, Peter is connecting God's work during Noah's time with baptism, which is interesting. But the ark, the ark serves as a symbol for the salvation that baptism now represents, doesn't it? Because in the same way that Noah and his family, they were saved through the waters that brought destruction to others. In the same way, baptism represents both cleansing and salvation through the waters as well a passage from judgment to safety in Christ, that it's a representation of salvation. Baptism is a symbol. It's a picture of the salvation that we've received. And so in that sense, it's whenever you go through the waters, it's like it's a symbol of the fact that we are, say, that we are dead to our sins and we are now alive in Jesus Christ and that we've been set free by him. And it's a statement to say that I'm forgiven I've been, I, I've, I'm saved. God has rescued me from the waters of hell and given me eternal life with God forever. And so as we finish Peter's message in 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm sure you'll see is both challenging, but it's also deeply encouraging because it's about how we treat our spouses. It's about how we interact with the church. It's about how we engage with the world. It's about living differently, isn't it? That we're called to love each other as family we're called to per pursue peace with passion we're called to respond to hostility not with anger but with blessing so that no matter what we face we can be pointing others to christ that we serve a risen and victorious king and we can live boldly for him yet with humble hearts we can live unashamed always ready to give a reason for the hope that we have in jesus christ let's pray Dear Lord God, I just thank you so much for your word, for the truth of it, for the encouragement of it, Lord, and for the fact that we do know that if we are yours, we are yours forever, that if we are yours, that we're called to live differently, Lord, because anyone who's encountered Jesus Christ should not walk away the same as they were before, but that you're working within us, that you have not left us as, or as orphans, but you've given us your Holy Spirit working within us to change us, to make us more like you, so that we can point others to you as well. But Lord, help us, Lord, to live differently could be so tempting and so easy, Lord, to just follow suit with the rest of the world and take things the easier way. But Lord, you've called us, Lord, to stand up and to give honour and glory to you in the way that we live, in the, in the way that we deal with our relationships, Lord, and, and all those things that we can point others to you. Help us to do so, Lord, in your gracious name. Amen.